Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, before I start, I would like to thank our partner, Altran, to, for supporting us in making this uh, conference happen. Thank you, the Altran team. How many of you know what HAL 9000 is? Which movie? All right. So I didn't, I didn't mean to put it to scare you. We all grew up looking at HAL 9000, Skynet, and Terminator, and really wondering, when is this going to be real? When are they going to take control of our lives? But finally, it seems to be happening. Things are coming out of university labs and Hollywood studios to real life. My talk had three parts. First, I talk about the evolution of artificial intelligence and some of the technology trend which is bringing AI to the forefront. Second, I talk about some of the key companies which are driving the innovation in the market, uh, both disruptive startups as well as large companies. And third part, look at some ideas of what you should, what you should do for you to build capability and drive AI-led innovation within your organizations. Those are some of the key points I will focus on in the next 15, 20 minutes. Alan Turing started the Turing test in the 1950s. Right? And when he did that, he said, in 2000, the, computer, we, the computers will be able to pass the test. We are already way past it. We have not, the computers have not passed the test. But we have seen AI evolve over the last 50 years from beating tic-tac-toe games to chess and geopardy and now learning to play by themselves Atari games. And there are four key trends which is converging today, which is making AI possible. One, the computational power is getting cheaper and cheaper. It's getting much faster. You can see the numbers there. And third, the data is coming from all kinds of devices, be it smartphones, be it IoT devices. You have tons and tons of petabytes of data coming in. And also the platforms to process these, be it Hadoop and a lot of newer platforms coming in for you to analyze these. A combination of this and then looking at the algorithms with university professors and research labs have painstakingly built over the last 30 years. A com combination of these trends along with these algorithms is making AI possible. When Deep Blue, the IBM's supercomputer, Ben Kasparov, the AI experts said it's going to take 100 years for computers to beat human in Go, a famous game in China. Just in 20 years, Google's AlphaGo has been the human champion consecutively. A massive change. And we can argue that, hey, games is it's constrained. Everybody knows all the constraints are. The, the in data inputs required to make decisions is known for board games. But we are starting to see things in AI is moving from games to real world where things are unpredictable. The controlled data points constraints are not very known. And you can look at the example here. George Hodge is the CEO of a company called Commodore AI. How many of you heard of this company? So Commodore AI is a, is a startup based in, in, in the Silicon Valley. And the founder wrote in a few months using crowdsourced data and machine learning algorithms and autonomous solution, which worked pretty decent on, on highways. The company has already got $3 million funding to employees. And now they're opening up the eight hours of data they have from, on, on, from the uh, autonomous driving they're there, making it available online so anybody can train the convolutional neural networks to do other ADAS solutions. Very interesting startup coming in. It's not Tesla. Some couple of engineers sitting in their lab using the backend API of Google and trying to disrupt large OEMs who have been in the business for the 100 years. And it's not just in product features. We are starting to see that happen across various aspects of the value chain. Take an example of automotive. Companies are just Autodesk are using data from yeah, sensor data, video data from prototype cars, inputting that along with some constraints. Hey, what is the material going to be? What is the manufacturing uh, process going to be? What are the performance criteria? And even cost limits. 
And then the, the mission throws out, hey, here is the three or four designs of the car uh, you can potentially build. Right? Even the designing of the car is AI is going to play a significant role, and not just that. In financing, after sales, a lot of the different aspects of the value chain, AI is starting to play a significant, significant role. And not just automotive. You can look at all of these industries here, consumer software, enterprise software, BFSI, auto. In many of these industries, AI is playing a significant role. Uh, Google, a company which is more focused on search and advertisement, by using AI today to train their, their software so they're able to throw the right set of advertisements to the right users. Look at companies like Microsoft, they're using AI for creating self-healing networks. They're able to reduce cost of their data center by 40% by using AI engine on the back end. Any area, any industry where software is going to be, play a big role, where data is going to be created in, in, in large amounts, as well as where the regulation is not going to play a big role, the potential for disruption through AI is going to be significantly high over the next few years. And people ask, what is this artificial intelligence? We have all studied about AI in, in our computer science courses, but what is this different, right? And AI is not just one technique, it's a, it's a combination of algorithms. You can look at machine learning, search and optimization, constraint satisfaction, whole bunch of algorithms make up AI today. And based on the application use cases, you're going to use a different kinds of algorithms to solve a particular problem. If you look at this, it's very clear machine learning is one which is playing a key role across all use cases. And even within, if you look at machine learning, even within machine learning, there are algorithms like decision trees, random forests, deep learning, a whole bunch of different algorithms. And if you look at machine learning and, and look at deep, uh, deep learning, that's the foundation of a lot of the innovation which is happening in the world today. And deep learning is nothing but um, it, it's an algorithm which is based on you know, animal visual cortex, which is based in 1969. That's when the, the professors started working on it. But today, because of the level of computational power we have and the amount of data which is available, these algorithms which have been developed and refined in the universities is becoming very real in the, in the, uh, in the world. And a startup based in Europe, DeepMind, is the one which has innovated on this, and Google bought the company and then made that part of all of the different products. And the AI innovations are happening across the, across the, across the stack, be it in, in terms of infrastructure, platform, and applications. And we see three types of companies which are innovating. One are the startups, right? These are five-member, six-member companies founded in garages across the world, driving innovation. Second, what we call is tech mafias. Right? These tech mafias are five companies. Google, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook. The market cap of these five companies is 1.7 trillion euros. Just these five companies. Right? And they're plugging in billions and billions of profits. So that's the second set of companies which are driving innovation. And third, the rest of the R&D spenders, the top R&D spenders across the globe. But they really not figured out where they need to use AI. And if you look at these three stack, and look at the tech mafia, these five companies, their business model is based in focusing on areas where profit pool of an industry getting aggregated. That's where they focus on. And now they're focusing a lot more on building AI platforms uh, and, and that's why we see them dominating what's the startups are focusing a lot more on building applications on top of these uh, platforms. And VCs are figured this out. This is going to be huge. The VC investments just in the last five years has gone up 10 times in artificial intelligence, 10 times, right? And the VCs also figured out, hey, this platform is going to be dominated by these tech mafias. So let me invest a lot more on companies which are focused on applications, building applications on top of these platforms. So a lot of the AI investment is going into this application area, um, and, and we expect this number will continue to increase over the next uh, few years. And a lot of this, if you look at the startup, there are about 2,200 plus startups across the world. Most of the startups are, are in one location. Right? They're all in the US, they're all in the US, in the east, west coast of the US. Then you have a whole bunch of companies uh, in Europe, Europe, 
in UK, France, and Germany, three big locations in Europe. And then you have companies in India and China. In US, the startups are focusing on applications. Some startups like startups like Sentinel, which got over 130 million dollars in uh, easy investment, focusing on platforms. In Europe, it's largely platforms, and Asia is largely on applications. So each of these location regions have an area which they focus on. And Europe is not left behind. Europe has over a billion dollars in startup investments are gone into startups here. And these are focused on different areas. It's focused on deep learning, NLP, computer vision, and, and so on. The interesting trend, looking at the European, uh, uh, European startups, is who is taking advantage of startups in, U in Europe. There were 30 different companies got acquired just in the last 18 months. Out of that, 90% of the companies were acquired by large companies who are not headquartered in Europe. You have a company like Google came and acquired DeepMind, paid them millions of dollars, and now is a foundation of the company. So a lot of the larger companies in Europe are not leveraging the startup ecosystem in Europe, which are building highly innovative AI products, is largely being used by companies which are outside of US, outside of Europe, coming and acquiring companies in Europe. It's something to think about as you, as you look at building your AI capabilities. And Google, I talked about Google buying DeepMind. And if you look at Google, what, what does the company do? Right? The company started with search. They have a whole bunch of services. And what has happened because they created all the services is they have data. Unfortunately, our personal data is with Google. Petabytes and petabytes of data. And they have one of the best access to in IT technology computational infrastructure. So you have all this data, almost real-time data. You have this computational infrastructure. And you add machine learning and artificial intelligence algorithms to it. Suddenly, they're able to redefine the solution they already have in the market. The way they do search is very different. If you have seen last week, they, they launched a, a, a new phone which basically understands what you talk. And then uh, what Google is saying is about their nat natural language processing algorithms are almost 95% close to how humans understand language. And this happened in the last 18 months. Right? So they're able to take that, and they're also not just using it for redefining the existing solution, but going after automotive. They're going after healthcare. They're going after air platform. They're going after cloud. They're going across different areas. Same with companies like Amazon, Microsoft, Facebook, and Apple. And you look at the, uh, Microsoft, uh, Microsoft has this research lab, which has been around for the last 30 years. They've been working on a whole bunch of new research. Last week, Microsoft shut down their research organization and moved all their research scientists into the AI, AI product group. Think of a 30 years of group which is focusing on all kinds of new research was shut down to focus on one single product area, which is AI. So you have companies like Google and Microsoft and Apple investing significantly, almost betting their companies on AI. Both Google's and Microsoft CEOs came out and said they are going to be AI first company. If you look at it two or three years ago, they said they are mobile first company, but things are moving away from focused on the devices, edge devices, to the back end around the cloud platforms and AI platforms. So big, big shift happening across these large companies. And when you look at this chart, the way to look at this chart is the, the x-axis shows um, the year these companies acquired startups, and y-axis showed the number of years the company has been around, right? When I saw this first time, the thing, the, the image which came to my mind was uh, a kid in a candy store with a lot of money. They go on and gobble up all of these startups, whichever they find, which is interesting. If you look at way back in 2004, the average year of acquisition for any of the startups was four or five years. Today, they are acquiring startups which are 18 months, 12 months. Somebody comes out and starts something with AI, they go and acquire the company. Right. So rapid phase of acquisition, what is it resulting in? It's the top entrepreneurs 
people who are building companies are coming out wanting to build AI organizations. So it's starting to create a snowball effect where you have more and more entrepreneurs across the world want to build AI startups because it's very interesting for them to get acquired by some of these large technology companies. And big shift in a, in a very, very short period. And it's, it's been a long time since we saw any technology where the adoption is happening at such a rapid pace compared to what's happening in AI just now. And these companies are also leveraging global, global talent. Obviously, right now, because they're all based in the US, they have very large footprint in the US. But they are growing their centers in China, they're growing their centers in India, because a lot of the talent, the younger talent, which has to work on some of these technologies, are available in these countries, and there has been a rapid growth in building capability and talent pool across uh, India and China. The other thing these organizations are doing is making it open. Any innovation they are building is open, right? It's open source, it's accessible through APIs. Google has opened up the entire deep learning platform called TensorFlow. And any de developer can go and access both the source code as well as APIs on GitHub. There are over 35,000 uh, developers who are interested in building something on TensorFlow. And we found this interesting example. This Mokoto Koike, the person in the, in the picture, he's a, he's a son of a farmer in Japan. And the farmer does cucumber farming. And one of the biggest tasks they have to do is sort these cucumbers into size, weight, texture, color, and all of this complex thing. I didn't realize that's a complex problem. So this person has built a, a, built a, a device which uses Google's TensorFlow on the back end, which gave the training data. And it's able to now uh, accurately sort these cucumbers. Think of this farmer sitting somewhere in somewhere in, in Japan using a TensorFlow algorithm, which is just coming fresh out of research labs in Google, using it in real-world application. The time from research to real-world application dramatically reducing. And how many of you are here from IBM? You're ex-IBM. <laughs> so think of IBM's view on, uh, on AI. So IBM has built WhatsApp. IBM sells sales people, feet on street, consultants, go and sit with CIOs and CEOs and said how AI is going to change the world. And Google is making TensorFlow free. Open up the API. So developers sitting in your IT lab in some corner is using TensorFlow to build some new applications, seeing value, then getting adoption in the company. Which model do you think is going to win, IBM or Google? Any guesses? I'll take my bet on Google in terms of how uh, the innovation, because the, the adoption of technology in organizations, it's not going to be any more top down. It's going to be bottom top. When the, the technology team, which is driving those, sitting in that, they're able to use the technology, touch and feel it, see applications, and then take it to market. Right. It's a big shift uh, driven by some of these uh, trends. And there has been some public failures, right? And, and we have seen it when Microsoft uh, opened up one of, their, um, one of their chatbots, and it became a racist bot in, in a matter of few hours. Right? And we have seen these public failures. And you can question, hey, maybe AI is not real. AI is not ready for real world. But other way to think about is how products are built and tested is changing. There is a concept of beta products and software. Today, every product is a software product. Tesla is opening up their beta autonomous driving. We can question if it's the right thing to do or not, but that's where the world is moving. So you have to be open about opening up your technology and getting it out in the market much faster than what you are otherwise been um, trained to do. So big, big shift in mindset in terms of how you build and test products. And you can clearly see in this, we have rated the focus of, on AI and the future readiness of companies. And we plotted all these three types, right? We plotted the startups. We plotted the, what we call the tech mafias. And we also plotted the top five R&D spenders. And you can clearly see the top five R&D spenders are lagging behind. Even though some of them have initiators around AI, a lot of them are lagging behind 
in terms of how they need to approach the market. And because all of the industries are becoming disrupted by software, data is increasing in all other industries, where high level of disruption because of AI is possible across all of these companies. So we thought about some few ideas, like four things you should, you should think about, right? One is how do you identify business case and prioritize and focus on those areas to drive AI innovation? Second, create an ecosystem of data and try to own the data as much as possible. And third is about collaborating with the ecosystem. We can't do this alone. You've got to work with other people. And fourth, you've got to leverage the locations where the younger talent is available. So the four key areas, I'll touch upon a minute each on each of these areas. First is about identifying and prioritizing the AI roles. You look at this, I, now I'm a consultant, I like two by two uh, matrices. You look at one is application complexity, and the second one is the data complexity. And look at just two of the quadrants. I look at quadrant which is application complexity is very high, and data complexity is very high. Then you, you create AI to augment humans. It could be designing of a car, designing of a robot, or using uh, surgical robots. A lot of these cases are something that you AI used to augment the existing product. Then you have scenarios where application complexity is low, data complexity is low. There you go for complete automation and enable the AI to make, make those decisions. So you have to figure out across your product line where does it fit in. And based on that, you prioritize, and prioritize based on where the disruption level is going to be very high, where your competition is trying to, trying to drive disruption, and startups are going to drive disruption, and prioritize on those areas, and go, go from there. Second, try to own as much of data possible. Your product data, your after-sales data, uh, the data from web, or data from all the context-related data, your enterprise data. Why is coming like Google in a better position than most of the companies because they own our data. So it's very, very important. Data is a differentiation, it's not a commodity. So how do you own as much of data as possible from all your different IoT devices and integrate and create a data bank with which you're able to drive AI innovations? Third, you can't do this alone. And the world is moving away from um, in a, in a R&D organization where there is a, the parent R&D organization and there are child R&D organizations which all report back. That model is gone. Today it's what we call as an uh, innovation fabric where you have a combination of startups, universities and partners seamlessly integrate with your R&D organization to drive innovation. You look at a company like Toyota, they have partnership with startups, they're working with universities and also work very smartly with third-party service providers to integrate and drive innovation. And that's the model things are going to go into, and in that, you have to partner with startups. And you partner with startups in, in different models, right? You can potentially acquire them, you can potentially partner with them as a technology partner, you can take them to go to market with you, or you can just do acquire hire, just acquire them for talent. So a lot of different models in which you can acquire and, and work with startups. And then it's very important to have very strong platform partnerships across the stack, be it hardware, infrastructure, you're looking at AI platforms, data sets. It's very, very important for across all the four areas, you make the right decisions. So just look at the example of Medtronic. It's not they're trying to build everything themselves. If you're an OEM, a large automotive OEM, you understand what it is. So you work with tier ones, you work with all the different partners and bring it together. And you, you kind of approach AI very similar. And you have to also work with service providers who have capability across the stack and able to integrate the solution and bring it alive for you. So very, very critical to have a very strong partnership strategy. And finally, you have to look at the talent pool honestly what you have in the company. In many, many companies in Europe, the average engineer age is 45 years and plus. And you need this engineering team is, teams to be agile. You need them to understand all the new platforms which are coming in the market, able to test out, experiment, get products out of the market. You don't need younger engineering talent. And you need to go to locations where you have access to these talent for you to build out and grow your engineering organization. Building very strong 
AI capability and adding value to your customers is very hard. But we also already seen some of the European companies take leadership in driving some of this innovation. I'm pretty sure with some of these ideas, as a starting point, you can start looking at building some of your AI capability and driving value to your customers. Thank you.